So most of the market research that's been done has focused either in two areas. One is around the sort of cybercrime as service community. So that's where any individual can buy, sell, or trade information about computer hacking. So that could be your personal information acquired through a data breach. That could be denial of service attack where you knock a resource offline and a variety of other hacking tools, malicious software, things like that. And then at the same time, there's been a rise in research around crypto markets. Basically, any forum or community where people can buy and sell goods via encrypted networks, mostly on Tor. So the hacker research has largely been open web, driven by anything that you can access via a forum or through your regular web browser, and in some cases through IRC or internet relay chat. But the rise of crypto market research is a little more novel. But the focus there is almost exclusively around drugs. There's one or two studies that look at firearms, but there's very little else considering what other products might be there. So there's a big question as to how much overlap exists, how many products that are in the dark web are being sold on the open web, and vice versa. And then more specifically, what are the common intersections of these markets? So if we think of hacking tools and data as a digital product, how do they converge with the physical goods like drugs or guns or other uh, sort of material objects that you can hold in your hand? Now, obviously, buying a credit card number or a hacking tool doesn't produce a physical commodity that needs to be shipped or delivered to the individual in a way that matches with, say, a gun or drugs. But the payment methods, the communications platforms, all those things could have points of intersectionality. And so our goal with this project has been to scope the size of the market, what kinds of categories are there, what are the quantities, what are the price points, but also how do they converge? So what are we seeing in terms of operational consistency between the types of markets that exist? So there's these questions of open, deep, and dark. So when people talk about the open web, what they're really referring to is everything that you can access via your regular web browser. So that includes both what some people call the surface web and then the deep web. These are all the things that we can get to through Firefox or Chrome or some of the other browsers that are out there. The difference, though, between the surface and the deep web is that the surface web is everything that's been indexed by a search engine. So the cached Google history results that you get, or someone whose profile is available via Instagram or Facebook that comes up in those search results. The deep web, however, is everything that's behind a paywall or a password protection system or anything else that keeps a person from seeing the full contents. So these could be academic paywalls, journalistic ones, anything that limits access. The dark web, however, is a separate portion of the internet. So there are lots of different dark webs that are out there. It's basically encrypted communications operating via browser. And in the hacker community, forums have been a historically important resource, especially if you're engaged in cybercrime as a service, because it gives you the ability to advertise your goods and services directly to others. These little white circles that you're seeing pop up are different vendors for credit card numbers. So these are all different actors who we can go to for dumps, and dumps are basically credit or debit card numbers. So there's lots and lots of vendors for this. The complexity, though, is how do I, as the buyer, know who to trust? I mentioned that's a, that's a problem. If I've got multiple actors who I can buy from, do I go by price point? Do I go by reviews of products? What do I use to understand who's going to be legitimate? The space is getting even more complicated, though, because we're seeing this transition from forums where you can read every thread and kind of get a sense of who's doing what and why and how much traffic they engage in to a move toward what are called shops. And a shop is a single operator space. So unlike with a forum where I'm directly competing with everybody else, we're seeing the rise of shops in the underground economy as well. And a shop is a place where you are directly engaging only with one vendor. You don't have to see all that competition, and you can follow and uh, keep track of what the individual has to offer. 
So our project has been going through both the open web and the dark web and collecting as much as we can from different vendors, whether they're running shops, whether they're running forums. And so far, we've got over 180 different vendors in our sample with over 6,800 different product types. So that's a huge amount of material that's available. Our current data set is mostly focused around shops, and that's largely because we have so much information being sold in forums, it's taking us quite a bit of time to actually parse it all. And we also capture feedback. So I mentioned, how do you know who to trust? Surprisingly, like eBay or Amazon or other online platforms, you can actually populate it with information about your purchase. So others can know, oh yeah, this vendor actually delivers what they promise. What we're seeing as a whole is that whether we're talking about open web vendors or dark web vendors, they're almost all taking Bitcoin as their primary mode of payment. Historically, with the hacker community, people were using open payment systems like PayPal. Uh, for a little while, Liberty Reserve and eGold were popular, even one called Web Money. But those have become more porous and more easy targets for law enforcement investigation. So Bitcoin is thought to be a little bit more of a protective feature to use if you want to minimize your risk of attribution. There are some exceptions, though. We do have some vendor products that take different kinds of payments. Uh, some of the bath salts vendors, for instance, will go outside of Bitcoin. Uh, same for uh, cocaine and K vendors. We have some uh, booter and stressor, basically hacker services, that also say that they'll take PayPal. But that's a much smaller quantity compared to everyone in our sample. One of the other things to note is that I mentioned this idea of trust. One way that vendors can develop trust is through taking escrow payments. What that means is that there is a person designated by the community to act as a middleman, and they will hold money in escrow for a buyer and seller until everyone is satisfied with the transaction as a means of guaranteeing trust. Because if I've never dealt with you before, but you say you take escrow, fine, I'll pay the extra 5% surcharge just to know if I don't get the product I've paid for, you won't get your money. So it ensures a degree of, of satisfaction. And it's amazing to watch how these illicit markets have developed their own ancillary systems of trust, given they know that they can't use formal dispute mechanisms to handle problems. Instead, they've come up with their own sort of set of formal and informal strategies. And um, we're putting out a lot of briefs now that we're sort of nearing the end of our life cycle for data collection. We're really digging into analysis. So if anything that I've had to talk about today is of interest, you can visit our website here, cj.msu.edu, at uh, programs at CENA. We've got one or two page PDF briefs explaining our findings. We also are going to do some webinars in the next six months that will be open to the public. So if you want to learn more about specific product lines, for instance, um, we have an analysis of our hitmen providers uh, that will be coming up soon. Um, we're going to do another one around the drugs and another one around the identity document side. So we'll, we'll dig in a little more depth in those for, for specificity's sake. But um, let me go ahead and open it up to questions. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.